All right. Um, two things, three things. One, you've heard this already. Yay! Who knew it would survive? So it's like, this is, congratulations to you. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, because it, you know, yeah, everyone it's, was it's, it's, I wouldn't be able to do it without the project assistance, but I also wouldn't be able to, I mean, if it were just the three of us coming every week and sitting here and talking amongst the three of us, um, that wouldn't work either. So it's when people show up, we've got good discussions, and it always happens. It's amazing. The handyman wouldn't buy bagels and cookies if it was just the three. That's true. Right. So that's the other part, or any of the other things. <laughs> I'll ask you about this at the end of the day as well. Um, a reminder that Fridays I've got more lab participants because we've got a, a class coming in here as well. They've got great stuff to contribute. And next Friday we're not going to have a lab because we've got a teaching academy fall retreat happening. Um, and if you haven't been to those, I think they're pretty good. I'm biased. They're, I'm on the planning committee. This one especially is pretty good. Marcus Brower from the psychology department is coming and talking about um, actual evidence supported research on how to be more inclusive and how to set students up for success. Um, and that's next Friday during this time, 8.30 to 11. Um, it actually starts at 9, but we want to get people to get in there and grab their coffee and pastries and other things like that. Before that, so 8.30, we are ending earlier than we usually do, so people can get on and go have lunch. Um, but next Friday, no lab here. All right, so that's the slides that I have to talk about. Um, at the very top of the activity sheet, if you haven't already, go into the Canvas course. We've got self-enrollment for the Canvas course, mm -hmm. and there you will find the activity sheet, a digital version of it, which lets you add to, this is the most important part, at the very bottom, you can contribute to additional notes, questions, things like that. It's editable for anybody who's in the course can get into it. Um, and I love when people post in, paste in additional um, comments and resources that they have to share, things like that. That's great. And that helps us develop the next activity sheet on this and other topics as well. So that's helpful. All right. So the way that we start, I guess we'll go back to this one is what questions do you have about the lab? I will try my hardest to be able to answer them. I can't answer them myself, but um, as the conversation goes this way, I can steer the conversation so that we can um, get into questions that you have so that everybody walks away thinking, oh, I learned something and it was what I wanted to learn rather than a, people talking about stuff I didn't want to learn. Um, who would like to talk? Uh, start by sharing what they'd like to talk about today. <coughs> Oh, well, all right. Oh, I'm interested in uh, learning or how you can institute personalized learning in a large class environment. So like if you've got hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of students, it's a good ways to implement that. Excellent. Large class personalized learning, right? Personalized seems like it's very individual, which means like a lot of work. Good. Margaret or Shoko? Well, because I'm going to say I'm here to learn. <laughs> All right, here to learn. Very easy one. Yeah. Erwin. Uh, I would like to hear what people have to say about how to weigh, if it's personalized, everyone is doing something different. Yeah. And how to properly decide, well, what you're doing is just as valuable or just as the return on the investment is the same from the point of view of uh, assessment. I'm always concerned. It's like, okay, this guy's doing this and clearly took him a lot. so many More. hours of this person, how do I provide balance, you know? So it's sort of about evaluation or grading, but maybe even before that, as you guide them into it, oh, I'm sorry, your project doesn't look as rigid as, or rigorous as But as how, how do I decide that ahead of time so I'm clear about those? You can do whatever you want as long as it's A, B, or C. All right, 
I'm going to answer that parentheses here, but make sure that we talk about it. Rubrics. Excellent. How do we design those rubrics? Very good. Was that what you were going to say? Yeah. Okay. Marjean. Oh, I'd be curious about some of the emerging technologies that help us assess that, especially in the large class classroom. Ooh. Is there any, I don't even want to say it because I don't really want an AI type of thing because I really know I like that or even want to deal with that if you ever deal with it. Emerging AI. <laughs> I know. Let's jump into AI. All right. <laughs> Good. Duncan. Um, I'm not sure. I've done some experiments along this line, but I guess I'm here to get motivated to do more of them. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> they're a lot of work. Um, and uh, let me actually put that down. Um, logistics work. Our instructor. And I think that fits in with Irwin's as well. Like if you have people doing it, you've got to figure out is this too, equitable. is this up to snuff? Is it equitable? Yeah. Very good. JT, any questions? Yeah, speaking of equity, um, is personalized learning a form of tracking? Ooh. Ooh. I'm going to put tracking in scare quotes, too, so we know that it's evil. Theo, got any questions you want to get answered here today? Things to bring back to the business? I looked in here, and then I went upstairs. Oh, good. Well, thank you for coming down. We have a cake. We have cake because it's our 200th lab, so you should eat a lot. Personalized learning, any ideas or thoughts you want to... Explore or leave having explored. I guess, yeah, I don't know. Like, sometimes people put together their own experiences, I guess, or it seems like sort of self directed courses. And that might be something to get into. Okay. How do you like reconcile? Say that last part again. How do you, how do you reconcile like people's you know, self directed learning and you know, personalized learning? And stuff? Excellent. That's a lot like Erwin's. How do you judge the worth of the individual work uh, that they do? Good. Heidi. We're talking about personalized learning, but um, personalizing feedback or customizing feedback, how we might be able to leverage Canvas rubrics or video to maybe deliver feedback for learners who are more auditory or want to read. Um, does anyone have any experience <coughs> different, um, different functions in Canvas? Good, and that's another logistic connection there as well. If I give auditory feedback to everybody, is that more work for me? Do some like it, do some not like it, good. Megan. Uh, Megan, I'm just, uh, well, we do a lot of, we do jigsaw activities in our classes, and um, we do some uh, of this personalized learning more informally, like when we have, you know, <coughs> talking to students in office hours and stuff like that, but I'm interested to see what other people are using. Great. I'm curious to have um, your take on the jigsaw and see whether it aligns with what we put in the activity sheet, or mm -hmm. did we go someplace totally different than with the way that you do it? Okay. A couple things. One kind of related to the module zero mm -hmm. and getting people from a lot of different backgrounds kind of at the same position when you launch a course. And also, what caught my eye was the H5P branching scenarios, and we use those a ton in press books. Mm. And this summer, I had students write Ooh. practice questions for each other um, at multiple levels of Bloom's taxonomy. Mm. Just so uh, <coughs> curious about what the ideas were around that. I'm going to put from that student to student activities. That way, I capture both the students making things for students, mm -hmm. but also the, um, I don't know, we'll dig into it more. Great. Please. Um, I think uh, backing out, so like how would you actually um, design these so that the individual, like how do you decide which options to offer 
kind of a little bit logistics and maybe a little bit rubrics? Like, how do you, you have a goal in mind, how mm -hmm. do you get from a lot of different starting points to the same goal? I'm going to put that as how to start. How to start. That's how to start. Cliff? Um, I'm just here to learn. Just here to learn. Learning right. and Kate. <laughs> very good. <laughs> that I'm also very new to teaching, so I just wanted to All right. And Margaret, any questions you have that you want to see addressed today for personalized learning? I think I spent probably uh, itemized. Been covered. All right, excellent. <laughs> so let's start with what is personalized learning? Because if you look on YouTube, there are lots of different things. Educause has a thing on personalized learning, a nice little video. And the first comment, actually the only comment on it is, that's not individual. That's not personalized learning. That's individualized adaptive learning. Oh my goodness! <laughs> right. What's the difference? What is personalized learning? <coughs> it's kind of like individualized adaptive learning. Yeah. Okay. Could it be student directed? I think that that might be a big part of it. Individualized adaptive learning is the instructor saying, here, here are three different technologies that you can use, and if you get to this point and you do the branch and scenario, I have determined what three scenarios you can choose. Whereas maybe a more, um, a more personal, maybe that's a version of personalized because that gives the student three choices. So you've got agency there. You're not just saying, here's the content, you have no choice other than to learn it or not learn it. but Here's the content, and when you re reach this situation, do you go down path A and explore path A? Do you go down path B and explore path B? Or do you go down path C and explore path C? Multiple choice questions also give you that choice, right? But it's not really an exploration of what happens if I choose B or C instead of A, but it's kind of a, oops, I got it wrong, that's what happens. <coughs> this pathway lets you explore and more fully understand what the difference is. But it's often, crea often created by the instructor who comes to it from their area of expertise and they know a lot of things and so they miss out on a lot of the things. Um, and later on I really want to get into the student created stuff because the student to student perspective, they're coming in as novices, so the choices and questions, the situations that they pose will be quite a bit different than what an instructor poses them. I think there's probably a scale of uh, <coughs> personalized learning, but um, it, it, I think back in the day, some of that high level stuff was called outcome based learning, where the outcomes were determined, but the path to get to those outcomes was either co created by the students or there were multiple ways that students could show proficiency. We actually have at our upper middle school in Sun Prairie. One house that's dedicated to personalized learning, and it's outcome based, and the students decide how they're going to get there. It's all project based. All right, outcome based learning or project based learning, and then what's on the other end? Well, if we think about what they're talking about, like adaptive computerized modules, maybe where it's uh, they answer questions and either go an easier question or harder question based on where they're going, so they get some sort of feedback. I don't know if that's on the other end, but. Yeah, it, it may be more of the limited options. And whereas over here, it's sort of the sky's the limit. Here's where your outcome. You figure out how to do it, and whether it's, you know, modern dance or, or in five part essay or, you know, any of the traditional things, it's up to you as a student to figure that out. Or just even something as simple as you get to choose the topic of your essay. Right. If you have a final essay for class, you choose the topic. Yep. Right. Everybody writes a five page essay or five part right. essay, but and it's gotta be on this topic, but within this topic you can choose A, B, or C. And we've probably all seen syllabuses like that and assignments like that. Here are ten topics that you can write on. You have your choice. You have some agency. I loved that because ten choices is way better than write an essay on this one topic, which still, you know, lets you have a lot of choice within how you write that top based on that topic, but it's it's quite a bit limited. Theo and then Erwin, right? Yeah. 
Um, there's it's less top down. Less, I guess so. It's sort of more democratic, or like maybe more questions driven rather than answers driven. <coughs> oh, I like that too. Like yeah. questions more interactive. I just it's like you know. And that gets to the individuality of students and learners and their experiences and how they approach the topic, whatever the topic is. Some of them often think, I've got no connection to this topic at all. The only reason I'm here is because I have to take this course, right? Is that usually true? No. They usually <laughs> always have some sort of connection, but they don't understand it yet. Um, we know from learning science research in fact next Friday at the fall retreat on inclusive teaching Marcus Burrow is going to be talking about this I think self-generated utility value when students generate the utility of what they're doing they they succeed way more than if they don't know why they're doing what they're doing they don't know why this or how this fits into their life and even better than if you tell them Eat this life cereal, it's good for you. That's okay, that's a little bit, but if they can come up on their own, that's great. So that perspective and how they, how they approach it, if we can personalize the way that they find connections to it. Um, and this is important, I think. This is a thing that if we can have our students find a connection, now all of a sudden they have done some stepping towards the content instead of, as you said, top down. It's sort of a, I'm approaching the content looking for a reason to make it important. And then they have ownership because they started taking action <coughs> towards that. And ownership's good. Wait, Erwin? Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask, two semesters ago I taught a class on writing and they had like different types of writing that they could produce and one of them was a review. And so I went on and I listened to this podcast. And I listened to 10 episodes. And it says, go to this podcast and pick between these 10 episodes. Great. Mm -hmm. And I have one student that's like, I didn't like any of those, so I did it at 11. Oh, <laughs> good. How do you approach that? Because that means that is for me to properly evaluate that. Then I have to, in addition to the 10 that I already listened to, I'm going to have to listen to 11 so I can give her that student a good feedback, which I didn't do. I says, no, go back and listen to the tent. And, <coughs> and then, of course, she don't bring it back in my uh, teacher's evaluations at the end of the semester. So how do you guys deal with that? I did the same thing with TED Talks when I was teaching the Wisconsin Experience course on good learning. Like, here are 15 TED Talks on this topic. Figure out which ones you want. If somebody else has already, if somebody's done one, you have to go choose a different one. So what happened was <coughs> they didn't just watch one video that I assigned them. They went through and they watched 10 different videos, which is 10 times the amount of work than what I assigned them in order for them to get their choice of the video. And the ones that did it right away after class, they had, they had the most choices. In your case, not only did they watch the 10 videos, but they went and they searched for an 11th video. Well, which you're being very charitable as to what they did. <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't what? You're being, I think your view is very charitable. <laughs> I don't think, think the student went and read the direction. She went and picked, like, I don't like any of those, I'm going to do this one instead. OK. Well, how do they know if they didn't like any of those videos if they didn't at least scan through them? I don't know. I mean, maybe. Yeah. And that's a risk, I guess, in, in personalized learning, right? What did you do with that though? A lot of times we have to put the onus on the student. So we have to sort of trust the student in learning. And maybe it doesn't matter whether they watch one video or 10 videos or just a random video. If in the rubric that we put together or the outcomes, the question is, did they write a good topic or did they write a, did they respond, did they write a good review that hit all of the points that you were trying to get them to hit? 
in which case does it matter whether they watched that or a SpongeBob video if they did a good job in in responding? I do on that. On on what you go and listen to the eleven video. Oh right, because they could make make something up on that video. That is extra work for you. That's true. It is. It was. So you can say no. Yeah. I did on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> I did. But you're still here. Yeah. It didn't cost you your job. I mean, from a job perspective, you're still here. I think that uh, one way, another way to do that, and other people sh should chime in as well, um, is to say, okay, excellent, but the onus is on you, student, dear student, mm -hmm. to convince me, maybe in more of a way than the others do, by choosing your own, you're going to have to do a little bit extra work and make sure that in what you do, I'm convinced that you did this. Make a pitch. Like I have, uh, it's not personalized learning per se, but my students are going to be presenting short paper, like 10 minutes talk on a paper they read at the end of the semester. And so they first have to get approval from me on the paper to make sure it's not like something from the 70s and mm have -hmm. two figures that is not worth our time. You know, so yeah. making sure that I can say, yes, this is appropriate at first. So maybe having, you know, rethinking how the project works so that you get a little more say initially. They're still making their choice, but you're kind of. Yes, or no, here, have you thought about these other options? And but that would help you. We talked a little bit about that in the activity <laughs> sheet. And they still change. Them. <laughs> I guess, yeah, consequences. <laughs> Under the self regulation, one of our suggestions is schedule check ins mm -hmm. so that they don't do the whole thing and you find out later on that they've wandered down this fine little garden path, but that it doesn't actually <laughs> help them. Or like wait until the night before. <laughs> yeah. And I want to emphasize, including the peer feedback, if they check in with others, they'll get ideas about how to approach things. They'll share their ideas about how to approach things. They'll share a little bit about the content of what they're looking at. So it's kind of a jig sign in some ways. Um, but it's also a, you can do that? I didn't know that we could do that. Or, um, and it, it increases the accountability so that, oh crap, I have got to present something to my fellow students. I better do it rather than wait till the last minute. Other thoughts on how do we, how do we handle the logistics of that? How, how do you handle the sort of the
like during the week before the final um, presentations, we actually have work time in class. So I do try to do a lot of in class stuff. Um, but then we had, I had each group of four meet with the TAs for like a 20 minute session where it was kind of open, whatever they wanted to talk about. Um, and so people that came with a draft prepared got a lot of feedback. Um, or if they just had smaller written things and they kind of wanted feedback. But it helped, I think, for them to have something put together. So I know it's like, feels like grading in that sense, but since this was more of a meeting and there wasn't anything like written, it wasn't that, it was more of a verbal feedback and it, that seemed to be really helpful. And then the TAs also got the experience of like giving feedback and they got to do it a bunch in a row, so they had a lot of that and they got kind of more information than they went. So we did some kind of meeting, uh, which it sounded like we were trying to do. Um, the other thing we did is had specific questions to go through, so the TAs had a sheet of questions and the students also could see like these are what we're going to be checking for. Yeah. These will the topics to discuss, and so I think that gave everyone sort of a ground point to start from of what the meeting was going to be. I think, and that builds on what Erwin was saying about the directions. If you can have the the rubric, and I like the idea as a watermark, so it's kind of built in. It's not like a big paragraph, but it's kind of a. Is, did you have this? It's it's structured. It's a structured process for them to go in and and check. Did I include this? Did I include that? Because when they're asking for feedback. When they're asking for grades, they're asking for feedback. Mm -hmm. And they want to know, am I headed in the right direction or am I? And that's great, right? In self-regulation, this is them monitoring their own performance. They're like, am I, am I going right? Give me a grade. Does this look like an A yet? <laughs> you know, they want, they want that feedback. And have the other students give, you know, say to each other, how would you grade this based, you know, based on the rubric that we've created? What, ask your students, ask your fellow students. I'm not going to grade you, give you a grade right now, but what does the rest of the class think about your, you know? And make it a class, in-class activity. Go sell your project, whatever it is. Hey, can you grade me? Okay, can you grade me now? Like, that'd be a chaotically wonderful class, <laughs> perhaps. Hey, Jay? Yeah, hi. Sorry I came late. I was at another session. A um, couple things come to mind with these. Um, questions and concerns. One, any kind of self-driven thing I've ever done with students, um, it's definitely a conversation in curriculum design. Yep. So when they, if they were to come to me looking for that kind of feedback, it kind of changes what I thought was going to happen, so then I have to adjust. Yeah. And then number two, um, one, it, it one thing that keeps ringing true for me listening is um, like knowing the objective behind the assignment is really key. Um, so I did a podcast listen thing. It was about um, the process of making music. So we just said, we used to just choose a podcast episode from Song Exploder, but uh, a suggestion came in from one of the instructors saying, why don't we just let the students choose any episode from Song Exploder. And so we, there was no way for us to vet the episode, because there's like That's where we saying the equation that already yeah. had. But our point was, <coughs> listen so that you understand the process, and then let us know like what you think of that. So it helped in knowing that, and it depends on what the objective is, of course. Um, I guess I have a question about, do you feel like this is something that, a, a, you know, like a student new to a field, is this a, an approach that's well adapted to new students or a well -versed <coughs> students great, at a higher level? Great question. And that gets to your question. It's, it's, it's curriculum design, right? Here we are asking students who don't have any training or experience doing this. They're used to a certain style oftentimes. They're used to a certain style of structured direct instruction or some variation of that. And now all of a sudden we're opening up the floodgates and saying, go to it, be amazing. If we don't give them those scaffolds, JT and I were talking about this this morning, the idea of assigning roles. It provides them some agency, but it also means that you have to, you've given them some structure and they can work with that structure. The first time that you give them some sort of a jigsaw activity, maybe you want to assign the roles ahead of time. Maybe you want to assign the roles. And the second time, say, break it out into roles whichever roles you want. Maybe these three would work again. Maybe some other roles will work. Um, but that's the scaffolding idea. The first one's very structured for fewer points. 
The second one's a little bit less structured, maybe for a few more points, but still low stakes. And we sort of build up from there. So yeah, try it, test it, get them acclimated and accustomed to this new freedom that they have. Um, it's also more, more work for them because they've got to do all of this stuff on their own. But, and that's a little bit scary. So yeah, starting off with by scaffolding and with more structure. Or Jean, you can't wait. what Adrian was saying is be willing to like it not work the first time. Yeah. <laughs> and that's okay, like get, let them get their, meet their objectives other ways, but as so you have a backup plan. But, and that way you can kind of reverse engineer what went wrong as a case study. Or not necessarily what went wrong, but what could be improved in the next. <laughs> So, I mean, is that like essentially like giving the commission to fail a little bit? Yeah. It is. I think it is. Um, and, you know, as it, we learn best through failure oftentimes. Um, so, having some sort of a reflection after the assignment should be part of the assignment. And I think, ideally, it shouldn't happen immediately after the assignment, it should happen a week, two weeks three weeks after the assignment. Um, if it's a good assignment, if it turns out that it's a good assignment, um, it will impact the rest of the work that they're learning, right? If it's a crappy assignment, and maybe you don't want to do it again, they'll say this has nothing to do with what we're learning now. In the ideal learning world, what they learn on week one helps them understand what they need to learn on week two, and so on, right? That's sometimes hard for us to figure out, because everybody learns a little bit differently, but there are some general patterns that we can figure out, and this helps us, this reflection helps us figure that out. Carolyn. That makes me wonder if an opportunity for reflection would give that student who was told to choose a different podcast than she wanted to, if it would give her a chance, and other students a chance to, to kind of debrief and vent a little bit, and then it doesn't come out on your evaluation at the end of the semester. Oh, yeah. It's come out about the assignment at you know, a timely way. And it's also focused about the assignment, about what you yeah. learned and didn't mm -hmm. learn, rather than about the mean instructor. Yeah, good point. <clears throat> All right, let's 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 talk about tracking. Actually, okay. I had one thought when that came up, which was um, I got to briefly do a practicum at Verona High School, and I do a ton of personalized learning. Yep. I was working with a biology teacher for freshman biology, and there he had like six, five sections, I think, you know, throughout the day. High school teachers are wonderful people. Um, but something had happened with how they set up the classes, and so they kind of accidentally put some of the students that were struggling all together in one period, and it was not something that was planned. It was kind of like, all the teachers were like, how are we gonna fix this? Because we they rather. But so it kind of went into tracking because that group was having a lot more difficulty focusing. But the project, it was, since it was project-based, um, when I was there, they were doing, I think, phylogeny. So it was like, pick an animal, research that animal, create something. And then they had, um, like, homo sapiens, or early sapiens. <coughs> so, like, it could work. The issue was that the students that were struggling just needed more one-on-one -on -one time to, yep. like, help come up with ideas and that kind of stuff. But I can definitely see how it would quickly a problem unless you're setting your guidelines really specifically and they have to, whatever benchmarks they're meeting are the same across all the mm -hmm. projects. But that, yeah, that's a And that's where the rubric comes in again. I mean. But it still has to be flexible enough that you can hit it, hit that benchmark in different ways. So yeah. Um, JT and I are talking about this uh, as well this morning. Um, there's a link on the bottom of this about speedism, learning things quickly. And they, they talk about Thorndike, one of the early progressive educators. Um, and his whole thing was, no, we shouldn't bring everybody along equally, which is sort of the backbone of what we do in education, right? Everybody in kindergarten learns these basic things, and then they all move together as a group into first grade, and then they all learn this unit together, and then we go on to this unit all together. And what happens in that situation? Well, the slow ones is good. Fast track, fast ones get scored. Right. Chick Semhai's um, concept of flow, this idea that 
if we're in the zone, things are perfect, we're cruising, we get a challenge, it's difficult, but not overwhelming, not too easy that it's boring. It's just the right amount of interest for us individually. It's a perfect place to be. Um, but that's hard to maintain as a group because we're all different. So how do we do that? <laughs> Thorndike would say, well, we don't have to do that because we don't want everybody to have the equitable equal learning. We don't want everybody to be a doctor. We need hewers of water, no, hewers of wood and drawers of water is what the, the occupations of the time that they needed for people <laughs> to do, apparently. So let's let the college kids go to college, and let's let the laborers go to labor, um, and we'll have technical schools for the trades, and we'll have liberal arts schools for others, individualized learning. I have no interest in learning Latin. Why are you making me learn Latin? Just so I can be equitable with somebody who loves Latin? I don't want that. Yeah, the idea of learning at your own pace versus a course semester yeah. outline, Still it starts done. to break down there, right? In some ways, we have individualized learning because if I'm really interested in physics, I can go into physics, right? But within physics, I'm going to learn like all the other physics students, oftentimes, unless we get those project-based learning things going. But if we do the project-based learning things, now somebody takes on this huge project, and somebody else takes on this little project, they're done in two days, this one's, the semester's over, and they're like, I've got incomplete, I need help, how do I do this faster? In some, at some level, these, some of these novice students need that didactic prior knowledge background, you know, so they can't, there's things they can't miss, because otherwise they can't take that into personalized learning, and so. Personalized learning, what I'm hearing you say, yeah. is not, the end all be all. I wish it was, but we can't just have our like five students <laughs> five yeah. one. It's a maybe an aspirational <laughs> thing to get everybody to that point. Because then we start talking about self regulation mm -hmm. and we start talking about the students going in, finding the information that they want on what they want to do at the time and pace that they can. And that's that's what a wonderful life that would be, right? To just be able to learn what I want to learn and not have to do all these other things. So aspirational, yeah. I think the way you're saying this is a lot of times it doesn't seem very scalable. You know, like you know, if you if you're personalizing everybody's curriculum, you're gonna end up with you know classes of five to one students, and we have classes that have three hundred students or seven hundred students in them. You know, we're in sections and a couple of TAs to manage them also. You know, how do you deliver it appropriately, or how often in a course? Yeah, the best. all kinds of ways that this is really hazardous, even within the major, the different tracks and electives, blah, blah, blah. A lot of traditional yeah. methods, but you know, eventually, it's the most important thing is you know, that they achieve learning. <coughs> yeah. And that is and the tracking, measure, right? And you, however they do it, right? But whatever your metrics are, I think that's the thing. It's not whether they have freedom or how they feel about it or whatever. 
Now, the thing might not be, you know, it might be a, not what you assign to think of some traditional content level, it could be something else. Those it's, are the metrics. It's, it's, it's the balance of pedagogy versus andragogy, the, the pedagogue being the, the Greek slave who guides the student down the path to school and teaches them, and the undergod being the adult learners, like, I don't want to learn that, I don't need to learn that, why? I'm going to make my own choices. College is a little bit pedagogy. It's a little bit about the students doing their guided along because they want to be tracked, they want to be guided to be a professional in whatever our discipline is. I have a sign up. It's for a few weeks. I like the thing about applications. A little bit louder. I like that students Thank you. think about applications. So, you know, now you've learned a little bit about acoustics in that lab. And this was the assignment there. You know, uh, 8.57 billion mobile phones on the planet. And if you had all of Amazon Web Server computing at your disposal, what would you do? Listen to music. Well, it was a great feedback because it was like this earthquake, so I'll uh, do micro weather, <laughs> right? Uh, great feedback. What kids is, you know, I was told I'm not supposed to tell you any of my secrets. <laughs> Intellectual property, you're going to yeah. steal. Yeah. Like completely bailing on it. <laughs> but actually, you know, it's just a little bit <coughs> question. This intellectual, this is intellectual probably the one I gave to you, so yes. Uh, <laughs> anyway, my reaction was this ethical and really just like, you know, I get it. I, I can imagine the scenario was going through his head. And so I turned into a learn a teaching moment, right? I turned it completely around the class of the student, raised this really good issue. And you know, I happen to know where all of the sources are on campus for student entrepreneurship. And they're all written down brush physics, you know, they'll do it. <laughs> But then I wrote back to him and I said, you know, why don't you give me the worst idea? <laughs> 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 or give me the idea of a friend. <laughs> or some, yeah, right. So, that, but the point I think the point was to try to turn it around. You know, why did that student like reject all Saturday YouTube videos? I mean, they had some reason. What was it? You know, and maybe, maybe you could turn it. You know, I have no idea that particular case. But maybe you give it a twist so it gives them back on track, but uh, like embarrass them, and a big conflict about it, right? Find out what the <coughs> deal is. You can't imagine it with them. Maybe turn it around so they stay on track, and, and maybe they raise a good point. So they, maybe your 10 videos were crap. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Dundee needs to reach a really important point. We were talking about some really big things, like problem-based learning or project-based learning, and that is really difficult. As we start thinking, like, how can the students contribute to this topic? Is there a small way for them to contribute? I think you're geological sciences, right? Um, geology, yes. Geology, okay. Mm -hmm. And what, which class do you teach? Uh, Geo 100, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, just thinking about, like, do you do rock formations and stuff like that? Yeah, just different rock ID, identification. So yeah. you, as an instructor, could come in and do your slideshow or mm -hmm. whatever, if that's what it was when I was mm -hmm. in that class. But, but interesting, it would be interesting if instead of that slideshow, student, you had a slideshow at the beginning where students have provided pictures of a formation mm -hmm. that they've identified. And they've got their phone in the back of their pocket. Now they're walking around campus, not just thinking about geology when you're in class, thinking about, oh, I need to finish this assignment. What is that? What is that thing? And all of a sudden, that's a, that's a two minute assignment for them. But it's a huge personalized <coughs> learning yeah. that contribu contributes to the class. So if we think about it in smaller chunks, it seems less overwhelming. And you had suggested Sifter for that, if I'm not. I did for for um, Allison. Okay. Who was in our class? Yes. Sifter.org. S i f t r dot org. That is still going. It's a still app going. that I helped to develop that lets students go out and take pictures of uh -huh. whatever your course concept is this rock formation, an example of popular culture, whatever, and share it on a map. But yeah, that idea of student-to-student -student learning, that's a, and, and in a small way, that's a great way to scale it up to a large class. Um, 
AJ. And then we need to talk about jigsawing more. Um, I was just going to say, we're kind of going there already, but um, even if it's just a portion of your class, like can you give away one week to say, this week you have to do your own learning so that you're still achieving all the goals, but it would, it would serve the students um, to get more engaged or feel like they, their ideas belong. And I was even thinking about like, usually that comes at the end of a class, in my experience, but it'd be cool to have that at the start of the class to kind of assess who your learners are yeah. and what their experience is in the topic so far, and then do a, a one at the final or somewhere toward the end. Yeah. Um, I was curious if anyone's actually tried that because I just thought of it now. That's the sort of related to the self-generated value of the yeah, class. Exactly. What is my connection to this? What is my experience with it already? Um, that's a good way to start out, yeah. So we could probably talk a lot more about um, large classes and, and things like that. But let's talk about <coughs> jigsawing. What do you guys do? Um, go ahead. Mm -hmm. What we do is we have, we do in our anatomy lab. Um, and we had a problem in our labs where we would give the students um, lists of things they need to identify, various body parts and stuff in the anatomy lab. Um, but it turned into uh, where, especially with prosections, where the students aren't actively dissecting bodies, where you know we're all standing around, say, a heart, and then we suddenly have 30 students around us all trying to look at one teeny tiny structure. Um, so instead, we came up with an idea that we would divide the content through it that they needed to identify in the lab into three or four expert groups and um, put them in charge of becoming experts in that one thing and then rearrange the class um, so that there'd be one person from each group um, who was an expert and they would teach that content to the rest of their group. Um, and on our end, it's worked really well because we're no longer surrounded by, I'm very short, and when you're surrounded by like six foot five people, it's, it's just frightening to be in the cavern. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the students were much more um, self-directed. We found, we, we actually found like, like, what, I'm not doing anything. We obviously check in with them, but it, they're not, no longer us giving a whole bunch of <coughs> them leading, um, leading them themselves throughout the various things that they need to do. And so we've gotten really good feedback on it. Um, a lot of the students like it. There's some students who don't like it because they, some of the things they've said is, well, I feel really overprepared in my area, but I don't trust my other um, colleagues that they're teaching me the right things. So I think that's, uh, that would be, if anybody has any ways to convince them that if everybody's overprepared, you can trust them yeah. <laughs> that they're teaching you the right thing. But I don't know how to. In healthcare, you just have to trust that your colleagues. Yeah, so we're trying to get them to. This is a this is a team based <coughs> industry. Yeah. You just have to, you know, start yeah. trusting people. Professional, professional. Yeah, because yeah. especially if they're wanting to go to med school. I mean, there's like they are all of the all of the overprepared students. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I would remind them of that core track of right. what and they could always go check the other other right. people's work if they want to do that extra work. Yeah. But, you know, in life, you rarely have the ability to gain expertise in everything and to check every mm -hmm. other, yeah. yeah. I wonder if you're going to be more diligent, maybe, if you don't trust necessarily. It's like, I'm just going to check. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to say, too, the, um, if there's some, like, small scale, like here's the objectives to meet in what you're presenting or whatever, then hopefully that could give the students a context <coughs> of like, okay, they've hit these, mm -hmm. you know, four targets for what they're presenting and I can learn from my fellow students. And that's actually a, by having the rubric, I'm trying to figure this out, if there's a way to have the students give each other feedback <coughs> on maybe the parts Maybe not the, the details, but did they cover this? Did they cover this? Did they cover this? They'll pay more attention and they'll learn better that because they're, I don't want to use the word assessing, but they're, they're checking. Mm -hmm. They are checking at, at some level against sort of 
sort of a rubric or a master. And you um, all have self-directed learning anyway. They can go into, if they don't trust, they can go into the lab and do their own little study. Yeah. And there's nobody there. Mm -hmm. And I think I need to have it. <laughs> <laughs> or at least didn't want to be in a group. And that one, I don't trust anybody. Mm -hmm. They're right. Yeah, that should have an option. Unless you have a very specific line and it's professional. I don't know if you have to get advice from people mm -hmm. and some of those learning goals and then you assess it. build on what, what Duncan said about options and, and tie it to how to start. I think that, you know, again, as an aspirational thing, personalized learning is very daunting. But saying, this is the way that I'm going to do things versus, do you want to do things this way or this way? Just give them one more option on how to do things, and you've given them some agency and the ability to choose. And anytime you can give students agency, you're giving them ownership of their learning. They feel a little bit more active, less passive, because they're not just being taught at, but they, oh, I have to make a move. I have to do something here. I've got to become an expert in this area. It's up to me. Other people in my group are relying on me to bring this area of expertise, so there's peer-to-peer -peer accountability, because I can guarantee that in those groups, the people that are presenting the information often, maybe not always, but often feel pressure to represent what they've got correctly because it's not just I'm writing a paper for credit, but I've got two other students relying on me to get this right information so that we can solve this problem. And student judgment is way worse you know, than instructor judgment, right? Well, unless we don't care at all. Do they go back and forth between expert group and I would call it at home group? Like um, in our case, they don't just because we're limited on time. But you can. I did try one um, time where they I went with an expert group and then the teaching and learning group, and then I had them mix up what they were. So basically, what they just learned in this teaching and learning part. Now you have to teach again. To so, so you're covering half of basically half of the content and um, that worked out okay. It felt like they um, I called it the challenge round um, because they weren't it wasn't necessarily giving them time to become an expert, but it was still allowing them to do that process of teaching something, which is we all know helps you know that you know something. Um, so I don't think it it all depends on kind of like the time you have. We only have three or four hours. I want to use that to segue into H5P activities and the idea of teaching each other is part of that becoming an expert. I've created this learning module in H5P or Pressbooks and, and or whatever else we have. 
um, and so I'm going to teach it to you. I have to know my stuff. I have to decide what I'm going to put in, what I can leave out because it's less important. What do I focus on? What are the learning outcomes? Having the students reflect on what are the important things in what I've just learned that are important enough to give to the next person. That's deep analysis and blues. Can you guys talk a little bit about that activity and the H5P mini modules that you had them create? Well, we as instructors really liked it. We did this with our position assistant students this summer. Um, so they learn anatomy, but they're going to be clinicians, so they have to apply everything they know. And some of them despise the fact that exams aren't just put a pin in something and I'm going to name it and then move on with my life. But to ask follow-up questions about you know, if this is damaged or relationship questions or functional questions. So to try and teach them how to think progressively from first I need to name it to then I need to know what's next to it and then I need to think about if, you know, it's damaged, what's going to happen. We had assignments, so within their dissection teams, which is about five people, um, seven times over the course of the summer after a dissection, they would have to write three questions at three different levels of blooms with three different H5P styles. So wanted them to really think through um, kind of that process and, act and train themselves to think that way, we hope, to super basic, I just need to recognize it and name it, to up a couple levels, to um, a clinical sort of question, uh, which is what our exams are all about, our clinical sort of questions. And we thought they did a pretty good job. Uh, there were some pretty simplistic questions. We took it, I mean, we gave them feedback on the questions that they wrote, made them rewrite them if they were incorrect or if they didn't follow the three different styles, three different levels, et cetera, to try and um, get them really following the rubric that way. Uh, feedback kind of told us that they learned, they felt like they learned more from doing it than reviewing other people's questions. Because then we created this press book that had all the questions in it they could then use as a review activity to prepare for exams. Yeah. And I'd say the dominant feedback was, yeah, it was interesting and cool to do it, and I learned from it, but I didn't necessarily use other people's questions that much to prepare. Which is a good reason that you had them do their own. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and even having them write a question is a, uh, also another great, very easy way to start. You don't have to have them go to h5p.org and creating these ornate mm -hmm. things and looking up Bloom's cognitive taxonomy and having them say, I uh, did an understand one, I did a synthesis one, I did an analysis mm -hmm. one. That's above and beyond a way to start. Any last questions in the last minute before I make you fill out little activity uh, reflection sheets? All right, again, next Friday we have the uh, fall retreat on inclusive teaching, so we're not going to have a lab next Friday. This Friday we will have a lab, so come on back. It'll be a little bit more crowded, and we're getting more food for that, but no cake.